All right, well, I think we are ready to go. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight for our, our Nature Talks Impact and Innovation. Uh, this presentation tonight celebrates the work of our partners that are part of the Conservation Science Impact Fund. Um, so this is the third year of presentations for, for this program. Um, and, and through the, the Conservation Science Impact Fund, we've supported nine unique projects since 2018. Uh, so this fund allows NCC to proactively support research that will help to improve conservation work, um, enhance our stewardship work, uh, and gives us a, a proactive approach to sort of uh, supporting research projects that happen in Alberta. The program so far has been funded by George Castles and the Canadian Western Bank, and um, we'd like to just thank them for their contributions up until now. So my name is Craig Harding. I'm the Director of Conservation Science and Planning at the Nature Conservancy of Canada for the Alberta region, and I'll be your moderator today. I'd like to start uh, by stating that we at the Nature Conservancy respectfully acknowledge that the work we do and the supporters joining us today are spread across the country on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For a millennia, Indigenous nations have worked to protect these landscapes and, life, uh, and the life that these areas sustain. And I'd like to thank the original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. So the Nature Conservancy of Canada, of Canada is a national charity. It's Canada's leading not-for-profit private land organized conservation organization. We do work to protect uh, the most important natural areas and the species they sustain. Since 1962, NCC and its partners have helped protect over 14 million hectares. That's 35 million acres from coast to coast to coast. To learn more, you can visit our website at natureconservancy.ca. So today we'll be joined by four very special guests. Uh, first, we have Zachary Moore, who is the Weston Family Conservation Science Fellow, and he's currently working on his master's degree in natural resource management at the University of uh, Manitoba. We have Sue Mahalski, a rangeland ecologist, rancher, and consultant. We have Jeanette Dooley, who's a wetland ecologist for the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute, and Emily Bryan, who's the natural area manager in the Castle Crow's Nest Watershed for the Nature Conservancy of Canada. So before we begin the webinar, and I hand it over to these fine folks to present on the work that they've been doing, uh, I'm just going to go through quickly through a few housekeeping items. Um, so as we're being joined by people across the country today, it's a pretty unique experience we find ourselves in. Usually this is a, a smaller event held in downtown Calgary or, or something like that. We've got people from all across Canada joining us today. If you do have any glitches um, in the live stream, um, try and re-sign in, just use the same link again. Um, and if everything fails in that regard, then we'll be sending out a recording and, and you can watch the recording afterwards. So a couple other items, uh, just please remain on mute during the presentations. Um, that will help us sort of move quickly through things. As well, the best view for this is, the, is sort of to use the speaker view so that you can see the face of the individual speaking instead of all of the faces along the side of the screen. Today's webinar is being recorded, so we'll be sending the link after the invite. So keep an eye on your inboxes um, and feel free to share that with friends and colleagues if they miss this event and you think that they'd be interested. interested. Uh, please also ask, put for provide your comments and questions. There's a little chat button at the bottom of the screen. So following this, there will be a Q&A. Uh, if you think of questions throughout, um, you can just add questions into the bottom and we'll try and go through those questions at the end when we have a bit of a Q&A period. So at this time, I will introduce our very first speaker. So this is Zachary Moore. Uh, Zach's an emerging environmental professional in the field of conservation and restoration. After his bachelor's degree, he studied ecosystem restoration in a post, uh, through a postgraduate certificate. Uh, he took the field skills he learned in this program and applied them to as a conservation intern with NCC in Southern Alberta, where he helped to monitor conservation projects near the Waterton Park front. Zach then became one of the inaugural recipients for the Weston Family Conservation Science Fellowship, and he's now a candidate for a master's degree at the University of Manitoba. Zach, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks, Craig. Can you guys see my screen there? There we go. Great, so thanks for the introduction, Craig, and thanks everyone for joining us here uh, at the end of your afternoon to hear a little bit about some of the work that we've done. As Craig mentioned, I spent the past two years or so kind of working with NCC on and off, and now I'm one of the inaugural recipient, recipients of um, 
a scholarship to fund uh, NCC specific research on NCC properties. Um, and so I'm just at the first year of my master's here at the University of Manitoba. And so uh, I don't have any results to share with you guys yet, but I am hoping to kind of give you a little bit of a rundown about the work that I am been doing and uh, kind of what we're hoping to get out of it. I was really fortunate uh, last summer to receive the CSIF funding to be able to get a preliminary field season in to collect some initial data and do some site assessments. And so that's why I'm sharing this information here. So to start off, grass and songbirds have been have experienced the greatest declines of any bird group in North America over the last 50 years. Now, largely this has been due to habitat conversion from native prairie to intensive crop production. And so most of the remaining native prairie is not actually in public parks, but it's on private land. And much of that private land, especially in Alberta, is used actively for cattle production. And so this is an interesting kind of interaction because the cattle actually mimic the natural disturbance regimes that bison populations would have had on these grasslands. Um, throughout their evolutionary history. And so in that way, having these cattle on the landscape actually helped to um, maintain these grasslands, right? And so, um, but just like any human management, you know, um, some practices are better than others. Some things have more impacts than others. And the impacts of cattle on grassland songbird populations has been really well studied kind of in this yellow area here throughout most of the grasslands of Alberta but has been less so studied in the parkland regions, which include you know, this big chunk of central parkland to the north of the grasslands, and specifically this little chunk of uh, parkland down in the southwest corner that I focused on. And so within these parklands, uh, there's kind of a wide variety of habitats. And you're gonna get some areas that have you know, large tracts of open grassland, and then interspersed between these chunks of grassland, you're gonna have aspen forest. And so these parkland areas support some of the same species that you're going to find in the grassland areas, but, provo but provide much different landscape contexts and have a pretty starkly different um, source of resources for populations. So this is a map of one of NCC's management units called the Waterton Parkfront. It represents a buffer of privately owned lands outside of the Waterton Lakes National Park. And it's managed simultaneously for biodiversity conservation and for uh, cattle production. So as you can see, most of these little green boxes here um, are within the Foothills Parkland Natural Subregion of Alberta. And this is kind of a transitionary zone between the Foothills Fescue Grasslands, this big yellow spot, and uh, the montane environments within the Rocky Mountains Natural Region. And this green buffer is only about you know, 10 to 12 kilometers wide. And so uh, closer to its eastern boundary, it's really a lot more like the open grasslands you'd find in the Foothills Fescue, you know, few wetlands, high productivity. Um, and then towards its western boundary, it's a lot more like the montane environments that you're going to find um, kind of as you get up to higher elevations um, with closed forests. And so in this way, um, this kind of 10 to 12 kilometer stretch provides this really unique way to kind of look at this gradient of open, for, of open grassland to closed forest on a bunch of uh, projects that are managed for conservation and for cattle production uh, across this um, really unique kind of set of uh, landscape and uh, management. So, what I'm really interested in looking at is how birds select their habitat. Um, and you can kind of think about this at two pretty simple scales. You have your landscape scale, which would be, you know, your quarter section, your section, even a couple of sections. And then you have your local scale, which is the things that are happening kind of down at the ground, you know, within, within the grassland patch itself. So at the landscape scale, you can think, well, how much grassland is there? You know, that's a key factor that's going to be limiting which species you find in these areas. And so within that, you can think that um, a lot of species have been shown to be what's called area sensitive, which means that these bird species won't occur in patches of grassland that are less than a certain size. And that's largely due to interactions with the edge of the habitat as well. And so as you get to, you know, a forest edge of a grassland or to oil and gas infrastructure or to a road or something like that, conditions change. And you might find that closer to forests, you have you know, more shrubby cover, you have more predators kind of going along that edge that might come and attack the nests. You might have competition with some of the edge specialist species. 
And so there's a lot of these interactions between um, not just how much grassland is there, but how is it laid out? Is it one big patch? Is it two smaller patches? Or is it like one long thin segment with some little dots of forest interspersed between it? And so you get all those different combinations in this Foothills Parkland area and seeing how that interacts with the local scale, which is thinking about, you know, what type of uh, grass is it? Is it going to be one of the native grasslands that's kind of these um, fescue bunch grasses interspersed with a couple of other forbs and things like that? Or is it going to be a tame pasture that's really, really tall, dense vegetation? And then thinking further about these kind of preferences for um, different grassland types at this local scale, you can look at the impacts of cattle grazing, which we can measure using range health assessments. And so I won't be looking at anything to do with manipulating cattle, but I'll just be looking at the range health at these different areas, um, kind of as it correlates with what birds are there, in which vegetation communities, and then examining that in the landscape context of how much grassland is there and how much edge is there. So why do this? I mean, the two biggest things that I'm trying to get out of this are to look at how grassland songbirds select their habitat in this really complex landscape that hasn't been studied a lot. And then how does this complex landscape interact with the local conditions in terms of the grazing impacts and the vegetation structure? And so at the end of the day, you know, the management itself is the prerogative of uh, NCC in conjunction with its partners, with the, the landowners and the leaseholders that are out there every day doing the, running their cattle operations and maintaining these grasslands. They're the ones that know what to do. What I'm trying to do is give them a tool with which they could use to predict maybe better um, what the impacts might be on grassland songbird and potentially identify areas that could be um, uh, hotspots for birds within this specific region. And that's important because um, a lot of studies that study grassland songbirds show that, you know, there's no one size fits all attitude. You need to study it in the specific context of it. So, you know, you can't apply a study from the tall grass prairie in Manitoba to the foothills fescue, and you can't apply studies from the mixed grass as well in the foothills parkland, right? And so looking at this specific context is really key in here. And you know, this project is part of kind of building an understanding that conservation doesn't just happen in parks. You know, biodiversity is all around us and conservation on private lands is really incredibly important for maintaining the connections between the people on the landscape and the wildlife that they share it with. And so knowing how we can, you know, alter or, or change our management slightly to, or select areas to best promote our conservation efforts will really help us prioritize our limited resources moving forward. So that's all I have for today. So thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to questions at the end of the hour. Great, thanks a lot. We're, we're super excited to... Uh, can you mute your mic there, Zach, for a second? I think, uh, thanks. We are really excited to see how this project progresses and how we can uh, apply that work to the Waterton grassland area. Um, so a quick question for you before we jump on to Sue, our next presenter. Um, do you have any thoughts on what it is about ra the ranching landscape that might be a benefit to grassland bird species? Yeah, well, as I, as I kind of alluded to at the beginning, I mean, grasslands were historically managed by disturbance, you know, um, by, the, by uh, fires set by the indigenous people or by natural causes or by the bison that would kind of come in and really heavily graze a, an area and then um, get rid of any woody growth that was occurring there. And so the ranching uh, really kind of mimics these natural forces while simultaneously having this economic benefit for the people there that are, are living off of, you know, their, their herds, right? So it's kind of this really unique interaction between an economic venture and um, ecological disturbance that really serves to benefit this whole endangered ecosystem. Awesome. That's great. Thanks a lot, Zach. Um, we're going to jump into Sue Mahalski now, our next presenter, and thank you for those folks that are using the chat box. We'll start getting to those questions at, at the end once all the presenters are done. So I'm glad that everyone has figured out sort of how to use that, that section. So Sue Mahalski is our next speech speaker. She graduated from the University of Alberta and has worked throughout North America as a rangeland ecologist and a conservation practitioner. Her work experience centers on livestock and range management, conservation planning, and agri-environmental policy. She's worked with numerous organizations, including the Commission for Environmental uh, Cooperation, 
Parks Canada and the Nature Conservancy of Canada, uh, and the Rocky Mountain Forest Range Association. She's also a beef and lamb producer with a ranch holdings in Saskatchewan and southwestern Alberta. Whenever you're ready, Sue, you can go ahead. All right. Can everybody see my screen? Can you hear me? Okay, good. <laughs> good, good. All right. So um, welcome, everyone. Um, Marilyn Neville and I just completed the draft report for uh, the recommended monitoring protocols for targeted grazing projects. Um, and we're actually working on developing a comprehensive manual on targeted grazing, covering everything from grazing prescriptions to herd health protocols. And we're hoping that this monitoring protocol will form one of the chapters of that um, larger project. Maybe, maybe we're going to continue this presentation. There we go. Okay. So our project goals were to evaluate the effectiveness of current and recent targeted grazing projects in Alberta and Saskatchewan, and to use that evaluation to design an appropriate or a set of appropriate monitoring protocols that land managers and municipalities can use to assess their own targeted grazing projects. Um, and why is this needed? Um, there are a number of reasons, but um, I've included just a couple of what we think are the most important ones here. So targeted grazing is not a proven treatment. There's quite a lot of skepticism about its effectiveness. In fact, um, one of the people that we interviewed from a targeted grazing project in one of the cities wasn't even convinced that the livestock were eating the targeted vegetation species. So there is a lot of skepticism. Um, there's very little peer reviewed research that exists. And most of the research and information on targeted grazing is based out of the US and not always applicable um, to our Northern climate and vegetation communities here in Western Canada. So why monitor? Um, because you want to know if the livestock species is sufficiently grazing the targeted vegetation, um, because you want to know if the targeted grazing program is having the desired impact. Some of these, these programs can be um, very costly. And if they aren't improving the situation, um, there are some other types of treatments that, that um, you can consider. And last, you want to ensure that targeted grazing programs um, are not having undesirable consequences. So there can be a, a, a bit of a fine line between grazing so lightly that you don't have enough effect on the targeted vegetation and grazing so heavily that you negatively impact ecological integrity. So you wanna monitor um, so you can figure that out and so that you can go back maybe and redesign the program or redesign the grazing prescription. There are many uses for, for the results of a monitoring program. So what did we do? We uh, looked at numerous documents on monitoring uh, targeted grazing from like general considerations uh, in, in uh, targeted grazing manuals from elsewhere to monitoring protocols that were specifically designed for a specific targeted grazing project. Um, we evaluated the monitoring protocols for seven targeted grazing projects in Alberta and Saskatchewan. We actually identified 11 targeted grazing projects um, and using a, a variety of criteria, we shortlisted to seven. Our plan was to go to each of these sites uh, and evaluate the progress but COVID intervened. And so we had to revise our plans. So out of the seven, we visited four sites. And then for the others, we held conference call meetings um, to interview and discuss the, the monitoring protocols that people were using. So then we designed uh, a recommended or a series of recommended monitoring protocols um, based on the, the first two uh, actions there and using the following criteria. Now these are criteria that apply to the design of any kind of monitoring protocol. So if you uh, are familiar with designing a monitoring protocol, then, then these will look familiar to you. So uh, standard accepted methodology so that if you have different people doing measurements over time, they're using the same 
methods and measuring the same things. Um, repeatability so that you can um, roll a, a monitoring protocol out over different sites, value for communicating results, value for comparing with other projects or over time, accuracy, and of course, cost effectiveness. So the document outlines recommended monitoring protocols for primary and secondary variables. So primary variables are those that are related to your primary goals. So the target vegetation, non-target vegetation that is important um, and ecological integrity. So for example, um, often a targeted grazing project is targeting an invasive species in a natural habitat situation. And so that invasive species is your target vegetation and the native vegetation is your non-target ve vegetation or your yeah your non-target vegetation so another example i can use is if you are looking at trying to reduce vegetation competition creating seedlings um, tree seedlings uh, so in that situation the competing vegetation would be your target vegetation and the seedlings would be your non-target vegetation, but you would want to know how both are doing, of course, so you would want to uh, measure both of those. And then ecological integrity is um, to make sure that the overall ecological integrity of the site is not negatively impacted. Now, secondary variables are not necessarily directly related to your primary goals. And so some people measure some secondary variables, some don't. Um, this is not a comprehensive list of secondary variables, but it is a list of fairly commonly measured secondary variables. So grazing intensity, forage production, wildlife habitat, riparian health, um, fire hazard, water quality, and rare plants. And um, I just want to point out that the fire hazard, fine fuels one uh, can sometimes be a primary variable, but could switch over into the other column. Um, right now, Columbia is working on a really comprehensive uh, monitoring protocol for targeted grazing uh, to reduce um, fire hazard. Um, it's, it's not out yet, um, but I'm hoping it will be available fairly soon. So for each variable, we've recommended a, pro a monitoring protocol. Um, the document also addresses frequency, timing, and intensity of monitoring, what should be included in a monitoring report, and provides information on where to go for more detail. Now, I don't have time to go through every protocol that we've developed, um, but I, uh, so I'll just give you an example. So for um, the primary variable ecological integrity, we've recommended that people use the range health assessment protocols that have been designed for most jurisdictions, um, certainly for Alberta and Saskatchewan. And then um, in the third column there is just where you can go to find the detail on those protocols. So our draft report is currently out for review. And when all those reviews are in, we're going to revise and make that report publicly available. Um, and we expect that will be within the next couple of weeks. Um, and I mentioned at the beginning that uh, this report will form part of a larger project that Marilyn and I are working on to develop uh, a manual for targeted grazing. So we're currently um, looking for funding to produce the manual or at least further components of the manual. So I'll close by thanking NCC and the Rancher Stewardship Alliance for providing funding for this phase of the project. Wonderful, thanks Sue. NC, I mean, we're very excited to sort of see these results progress. We've had, had two projects that were part of sort of Sue's work and uh, both for very different reasons. One site that we had sort of lots of seedlings that had been planted and we needed to do some weed management around uh, an area we were trying to reforest. And so we used targeted grazing in that aspect. And we also had an area right near the edge of the Crow's Nest River where targeted grazing was used in a space where it was too dangerous to sort of send people into. Um, and we didn't want to be using sort of chemicals to, to sort of deal with weed management. So thank you, Sue. We're really looking forward to as things progress. Um, a question we always get that I will pass along to you about goat targeted grazing is, how do the goats know what plants to eat? 
Well, the short answer, I guess, is it's complicated, but I'll have a stab at making it fairly simple. So basically, livestock select for plant species that will provide their nutritional needs. So it's something to consider when you're designing a tar targeted grazing project is whether or not the livestock species matches the targeted vegetation. So for example, goats need about 60% woody vegetation in their diet, whereas sheep need less and cows need none at all. So if you're targeting woody veg, you're better to go with a goat. If you're targeting grass, you're better to go with a cow. Um, so when goats go rogue and start eating things they shouldn't, it's usually because they aren't getting enough woody vegetation. But from there, it it's complex. So animals need to be familiar with the vegetation on a site to know what to select. Um, animals that grow up on a site learn from other animals or by trial and error what to eat to get their nutritional needs. And they can also be trained to eat different vegetation. But when you're bringing, vegeta or bringing livestock onto a new site, you need to consider that they may not know what to select for. So whether the, the livestock is targeting the vegetation you want will depend on whether they need the nutrients from that plant and whether or not they know what nutrition is in that plant. And so shepherds and herders are there to help ensure that the livestock eats what it's supposed to eat. Wonderful, thanks Sue. If anyone has any questions for Sue, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll say try and get to a few of them at the end. Um, I'd like to jump into our, our next speaker today. So the next speaker is Jeanette Dooley. Um, so Jeanette uh, has been a wetland ecologist at the ABMI since February of 2019. Uh, before working at the ABMI, she was a consultant uh, working with the Alberta Wetland Policy, uh, and she was a term lecturer at the University of Alberta teaching freshwater ecology and management. Uh, she did her doctorate degree at the University of Florida in 2016. Um, and completed her Bachelor's of Environmental Engineering from Miami University in Ohio. Uh, her graduate studies focus on wetland ecology and the relation between noise and land use intensity. Jeanette, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. Hope everyone can see my screen. Yeah, so thanks for having me. I'm very excited to talk to you all about eDNA. It's a very exciting new technology for monitoring and uh, it's been really fun getting my feet wet with it this past year. So I will be giving just a quick overview of the pilot project that uh, we, put, we put in place using, using eDNA. So um, this project really built off of a bigger effort in the last year to use more autonomous recording units or ARUs uh, targeting am amphibians. So if you're not familiar, the uh, ABMI or the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute, we usually spend uh, our summer collecting a lot of detailed data from a subset of our monitoring sites across Alberta. Um, and those monitoring sites are on a grid and span the whole province. Um, but uh, COVID kind of threw a wrench into our typical processes last year. And we were scrambling to figure out what we were going to do with a field season when we didn't feel we could safely hire um, train and house 40 field techs. So uh, one of the things that seemed like a good direction to go is using uh, remote, remote monitoring methods. And we took the opportunity to kind of dig more into amphibians, which is a taxonomic group that we don't usually focus on. But we've been using uh, autonomous recording units for several years to detect bird species across the province. And um, ARUs are not selective in what they pick up. They are just turning on those microphones when you schedule them to, and whatever is calling is, you know, recorded. So through our bird monitoring, we've picked up a lot of amphibians, and we recently started digging into this data a little bit more. 
Uh, so we took the opportunity that COVID presented to us and decided to deploy 220 ARUs across Alberta, uh, specifically targeting wetland habitats that we wouldn't usually to see uh, what kind of amphibians we could pick up. So this is a great map, but um, you can see where some of these ARUs were deployed. There's a lot around Edmonton here, uh, some down in the south, and a few up in the north. And this pilot project was really built on top of these ARUs that were already deployed. Um, and we decided to start exploring eDNA, the techn new, new technology of eDNA or environmental DNA at a small subset of these ARU sites. So just at four sites. Um, and when I say eDNA, I mean the shed genetic material of species from the surrounding environment that we then collect and then use that shed genetic material. So things like uh, sloughing of skin, uh, stuff like that that's suspended in the environment. And we use that material to then detect what species were present. And specifically, we collected uh, water samples, but there are other matrices that you can use. Um, so we were specifically interested in amphibians and using eDNA technology to see what amphibians we could detect, but we were also able to add on macroinvertebrates. So I won't focus on that, but we also used more traditional um, macroinvertebrate sampling methods in addition to the ARUs that we use to detect amphibians. And we will be able to use the same eDNA samples and analyze it for both taxonomic groups. Um, so the objective of our pilot project was to compare the two sampling methods that we were using. So in the case of amphibians, uh, looking at ARU detections compared to eDNA detections. And then we also had a temporal component. So we, the ARUs were out the entire uh, summer. And then we also sampled for eDNA monthly. So June, July, and August at these sites. And I did wanna acknowledge that this is a team effort. ABMI is already a conglomerate of uh, many different organizations that uh, folks are employed or housed in, like, for example, I am housed at the University of Alberta, and our field techs and field monitoring crews are actually um, housed at InnoTech Alberta. And then we're also able to group up with uh, Brian Eaton's team at InnoTech Alberta, who are really the eDNA experts and showed us the ropes. Quickly, just wanted to show you the sites. As I said, there we looked, we collected eDNA at four of our sites. Uh, they're all around in the Edmonton area. Three of them here were on NCC properties. Another partner in the project who was gracious enough to uh, support us financially and then also support us with uh, access to some great wetlands to the sample. We are looking for open water wetlands with about a hectare of open water. And that hectare was to facilitate our macro and our traditional macro invertebrate sampling uh, methodologies. So quickly just wanted to go over the actual sampling uh, scheme, how we collected the eDNA. This is a little complicated, but I'll walk you through it. Not as busy as it looks. <laughs> uh, here, I just wanted to show you a picture of us actually collecting the eDNA. So you can see this extendo pole, and we've got a tube attached to it at the end. And right over here, off, uh, off the camera, out of the screen here, is a pump and filter uh, set up. So using a pump to pull the water from through this tube from the wetland and filter it in place. Um, this is a method that uh, InnoTech, the eDNA group at InnoTech had already developed and were gracious enough to help train us, uh, explain it, 
and allow us to use it. Um, the advantage of it and what's a little bit unique about it is the sampling or the filtering in the field. So you can collect water samples and then bring the water samples to the lab to then filter the eDNA or the DNA material out of the water um, and, and then use that to do the actual analysis for detections. But through this method, you leave the field with a preserved filter paper that you can then take to the lab. So it's a lot easier to, to transport. Um, we collected water samples at multiple places within each wetland. These pictures up here are just pictures indicating our traditional uh, sampling methodologies. So we've got the ARU, and then we've also got our macroinvertebrate taxonomist doing some collection here. Uh, and we centered the water samples around where these traditional sampling methods happened. And we took three liter samples at these red X's. So there was actually two sampling methodologies that we wanted to test out. Um, the one we used at all the sites is this one depicted by the red X's. So three different samples, 50 meters apart along the edge of the wetland, collecting three liters of water and filtering it in place at each of these sites, at each of these places. Um, we took advantage of an uh, unfortunate event where one of our sampling sites we had to drop at the last minute. So, uh, and we were unable to get another one quickly. So instead of not getting samples at all, we added this additional sampling technique at one of our wetlands just to test it out and see how it worked. Um, in this technique, you're actually breaking up each of those three liter samples represented by the red X's into three composite samples. So you basically spread out where you're able to collect that material from, capturing more of the habitat, uh, increasing your chances that you might come across an area that has eDNA from uh, your target taxon. And each of these Composite samples are then one liter of water. So each, so three of them equals one of the big samples. And then just very quickly, uh, I wanna highlight and I've bolded here that these are preliminary results. We only have some of the results from the ARUs back yet. As you can see, um, Kalal here, this site, we haven't gotten to all of the samples throughout the summer, uh, but Hicks has a lot more here. Nothing too surprising so far with the ARUs, we've picked up boreal chorus frogs and wood frogs, which we would expect pretty common little guys. Um, and then I also asked the taggers that are listening to the audio recordings from the ARUs uh, if they came across any birds to act, to take note of that too. So we've got a couple bonus species here, a Sora and a Lacan Sparrow, which is pretty cool. So that's where we're at with it now. We're still waiting to get the eDNA uh, results back and the rest of the ARU results back, but I'm pretty excited to see how the two methods compare. Um, and I think, you know, ABMI is really interested in eDNA as a technology, because uh, we'd love to incorporate it in our methods if it, if it proves to be uh, comparable or um, a nice, efficient method for us. That's great. Thanks so much, Jeanette. Um, I mean, from NCC's perspective, going out and monitoring things like amphibians can be quite difficult. Some of them, if anyone's been out to try and catch frogs, you might hear lots one night and hear none the next night. So it really depends on weather and conditions and all those things and finding things like passive techniques to do sort of uh, different kinds of assessments are, are really helpful to the work that NCC does. So, I mean, a question we have for you is sort of how do you think that sort of eDNA will, could work to support stewardship or management activities in the future? Yeah, it's basically um, what you've said and just kind of uh, add on to that. Um, knowing what species inhabit different land areas is a big part of stewardship. It helps define the value of a piece of land for conservation 
or uh, perhaps it justifies some restoration work, maybe it can help you monitor the results of some restoration work. So, um, you know, knowing what species is where it, are where is important. And at a basic level, eDNA has a lot of potential to do that much more efficiently than those traditional methods, like you mentioned. Um, it's a passive sa sampling technique. It collects data on many taxa at once. Uh, you know, you have complications for things with traditional sampling methods where you are going out under uh, specific weather conditions, specific times of day. Uh, but eDNA has the potential to go out and get one water sample and then get information on a bunch of different taxon. Um, yeah, so I think the big thing is efficiency, which is savings of money, which allows you to do more of it. And that's why ABMI is interested in it. And I think that's why it's really important for conservation. Awesome, that's great. Thank you, Jeanette. If, as I say, if anyone has any questions, please type them in the box and we'll get to them at the end. Our, uh, so our, our final speaker today is Emily Bryan. Um, she is the natural aid manager in the Castle Crow's Nest watershed uh, in the Alberta region, which is in the Crow's Nest Pass. So Emily started working for NCC in 2019. She has a degree in wildlife management from Cégep de saint felicien from Quebec. Uh, hopefully my French wasn't too terrible, Emily. Uh, you can tell me about it later. Prior to working for NCC, Emily was an environmental consultant for uh, more than a decade. Um, she worked a lot on environmental impact assessments, uh, construction monitoring, uh, and things like that. So her experience provided her with a big understanding of wildlife and human conflicts, um, which if any of you know the Crow's Nest Pass, that is right up the alley of the work that she does there. Um, and she's been living in the Crow's Nest Pass since 2012. So Emily, uh, the floor is yours. All right, uh, I assume you can see my screen. Just tell me if you can. not all right, so uh, thank you, Craig. Uh, I'm really excited to talk to you about my project. It's called Reconnecting the Rockies, Alberta. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit uh, about the project itself, where it is, why we're doing it, and how we're doing it. <clears throat> and let me just organize my notes a little better here, sorry. Here we go. Okay, so NCC, the Nature Conservancy of Canada, is partnering up with Nostakis Institute and the ABMI that we just heard a bunch about uh, for a three-year wildlife monitoring program using camera traps. We will be monitoring wildlife on both sides of Highway 3 and at existing structures between Coleman and Crowsless Lake in the Crowsness Pass and at Rock Creek, just to the east of Crowsness Pass. And we just began the project uh, last fall. It's fairly new. So this is just to show you a little bit about the context um, of the project. Here you can see Sparwood uh, and Crow's Nest Pass, Lundbeck to the east, and that yellow line is Highway 3. So in that area, you have three very important wildlife corridors. Um, on the BC side of the mountain, going northwest, you have what they call the Alexander Michel Wildlife Corridor. In the Crow's Nest Pass, you have the Jim Prentice Wildlife Corridor, and to the east near Highway 22 there, you have uh, the Rock Creek Wildlife Corridor. And most of my project is focused uh, in the Jim Prentice Wildlife Corridor, which is right here. It's a very important winter habitat for large ungulate. Also, you can see that really funnels uh, the wildlife moving north-south. They kind of go along the mountains there. But we also have uh, a good amount of wildlife movement going east-west through Phillips Pass mostly. Um, why are we doing this? I don't know if you know, but each year it's 350 large mammals that are struck by vehicle on Highway 3 between Hosmer in BC and Rock Creek in Alberta. So that's just 75 kilometer stretch of highway, but it's pretty critical. So we want a safe, uh, we want a safer space for everyone. Roads like Highway 3 can, uh, can create a space where conflict can occur between human and wildlife. And I need to get rid of that point. Okay. Um, yeah, so obviously you have collisions, like I said, but you can also have animals that just decide to not cross the highway. We also know that mitigation, um, like fencing and wildlife crossing structures, can help reduce the risk for both humans and wildlife. So by improving our understanding of 
wildlife movement near and across the highway in the Crozness Pass, we can have better informed conversation with our partners and offer recommendations on the most appropriate mitigation measure. And for us at NCC, this monitoring is gonna help us make better management decision to maintain healthy wildlife populations. So we are using wildlife cameras, also called trail cameras. Uh, these are attached to trees or posts. They're triggered by movement. So as soon as it feels, sense some movement in front of it, it takes photos. Uh, they work 24 hours a day, so they're always on. And uh, the ones that we use have SD cards. So we need to go and swap the SD cards, cards once in a while to retrieve the photos. So far, we have over 40 cameras installed. They are on both sides of the highways, with, of the highway, sorry, within about 700 meters. And also at potential crossing structures like bridges and culverts. So you see like that one here is pointing at the culvert. So we want to see if any animal is using that culvert to cross the highway. So like I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a partner project between NCC, Mustakis Institute, and the ABLI. But we also had to partner up with a lot of landowners. So if you look at that map, these uh, purple circle are kind of our study area. And uh, yellow, yellow green uh, squares are NCC land. So the vast majority of our cameras are not on NCC land. So um, we needed to work with private landowners, uh, corporate landowners, leaseholders, Alberta government departments to get permission to install our cameras. And I was really, really happy uh, with the support that we got really overwhelmingly, almost everyone uh, accepted to work with us. So this is very exciting. And I think it shows that it, this is something that people care about. And you probably noticed that uh, the project is called Reconnecting the Rockies Alberta. And that's because there's another part to the project that's called Reconnecting the Rockies BC. So there's another team working uh, a very similar project just on the other side of the mountains. And it makes a lot of sense because these artificial borders don't really mean anything for wildlife. We already know that there's a lot of east-west movement of uh, animals between the province, uh, the two provinces. So on the BC side, um, the project is led by the UBC and the BC government. They work from Osmer to the Alberta border. They're a little bit ahead of us. Uh, they have already some wildlife crossing structures. So some of these green dots that you see uh, on the map there, most of them already have uh, underpasses. So this is pretty exciting. And they have cameras installed, so the same type cameras as us, uh, installed at all of these crossing structures. And they're gonna monitor the wildlife moving through them. So both on the BC and Alberta side, we're using the same protocols for the research. Uh, we're training our volunteers the same and the data is gonna be analyzed together. So really uh, it's two different teams, but one big project. And finally, most importantly, we would not be able to do that project without our fantastic volunteers. Like I said, there's over 40 cameras. That means hundreds and thousands of photos and we just don't have the staff to deal with that. This is, yeah, an incredible amount of photos. So we're using volunteers. Um, at the moment, we have 17 volunteers that are trained in the Crow's Nest Pass. These people go in the field, they check the cameras, make sure that they work, they swap the SD cards, then they upload the photos, and they go through these thousands of photos to identify the species. So thank you very much to our volunteers. Finally, I figure I would uh, finish by showing some of the photos we got so far, because everybody likes photos of animals, right? Um, we have a lot of cougars from everywhere. We got a little treat with these red foxes that decided to play fight right in front of a camera. Lots of uh, coyotes. The one at the top there is uh, carrying some kind of prey in his mouth. I'm not sure what it is. Tons of elk. Again, not surprisingly, because we have a nice herd uh, overwintering here in the valley. Uh, a couple of males that decided to clash right in front of the camera. Uh, white tailed deer. Here we have a little mama that uh, decided to groom her baby in front of the camera. A couple of white tailed bucks. Um, uh, well, a camus and a nice fat bear that was in the fall. It was uh, ready to sleep. 
And we had a few small mammals, so an American marten and a beaver. Finally, we, we even had uh, a nice surprise. We had that Northern Harrier. So we're really not targeting birds, but I guess it just happened to flow, uh, fly, sorry, fly at the right place at the right time and uh, got that nice photo. So yeah, that's it in a nutshell. We're excited to see in the next uh, couple of years what we're gonna get. And uh, yeah, thank you very much, Craig. I'm gonna take it back to you. Great, thanks, Emily. I'm always super excited to see all these photos as Zach is commenting about the great photos. It's uh, it's really neat to see them see them come in. Um, so the, the question that I have for you before we head over to sort of questions from, from others um, is how would this project inform land use decisions or the next steps that might support wildlife mitigation in the Crow's Nest Pass? I think the more data we get, um, the better decision we can make. So we already have some studies that have been done. So we do have studies on elk movement and we do have studies uh, that look just at uh, road kill, so just what gets hit on the road. But we don't have anything that really encompasses all of the species that we are looking at and at such a wide buffer on the highway. So really, the more information we have, um, the better decisions we can make uh, with all of these species in mind. And also with the BC side, it's going to be really interesting to compare the data where they already have crossing structures um, on the BC side, yeah, compared to Alberta, where we don't have them yet, uh, hopefully soon, maybe. Um, so yeah, that's going to be really interesting to see the, the before and after data. Awesome, that's great. Thanks, Emily. Um, okay, we have a bunch of questions that have come in, so I'm going to try and get to, I think we might have time for sort of one question per person to start. Um, and so I'm going to go back to the beginning, and Zach, I know you were answering some of these questions in the chat box, but I don't know if everyone was paying attention there, so I'm going to start with the first one. Um, so will you be studying more than just uh, what songbirds you, songbirds you find in the area, uh, for example, mating, nesting behavior, and clutch sizes? Uh, in relation to your project. And just while Zach's answering that question, if you do have other questions that haven't been put in the chat box, please submit them and we'll make sure that when the uh, recording gets sent out, uh, the answers to those questions are included for everyone. So Zach, uh, the question is to you. Yeah, so um, that is a no in terms of uh, nesting behaviors and nest monitoring. Um, this is the first project in hopefully a longer term monitoring program that will be conducted kind of in conjunction with future Weston Fellowship students. And so that might be a priority in the future. Um, I was going to start a, a banding program specifically for some of the species that we have there, but like everything else, things got pushed back in terms of critical training that would have had to occur for that. So um, yeah, that's a, just, just a abundance and occurrence this year. Perfect. Thanks, Zach. Um, okay, the next question is for Sue. You touched on this a little bit, but uh, another question came through. So uh, the person who asked it is curious to know if goats really are beneficial for targeted grazing, because from their experience, they just eat everything. Right. Uh, well, we do know, actually, from our evaluations. Can you hear me okay? Okay. okay. Um, we do know from our evaluations that they can be effective on uh, when targeting leafy spurge. So um, in that particular situation, um, the goats live there all year round and during the growing season, the landowners hired a herder to make sure that they ate in the areas where the spurge was and they are definitely having a positive impact there. Um, I do, however, agree with you to a certain extent. Um, they wouldn't always be my first choice for the livestock species for a tar targeted grazing program. Um, I would say if, if you were targeting woody vegetation, probably goats are best. Um, but, uh, but the problem is that uh, most organizations uh, contract a shepherd with their own flock and most of those flocks tend to be goats. So in a lot of cases, people just don't have a choice. You get goats because that's what that's what's available. 
Wonderful. Thanks, Sue. Um, okay, the next question we have is for Jeanette. Uh, and this is actually a really, a really great question. So how long is eDNA viable? Um, so when you're doing the sampling, are you pulling samples that are sort of like recent and fresh? Or are you just looking at sort of the historical eDNA that has sort of always been in the wetland? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it really depends. So the eDNA that we are sampling, uh, you know, genetic material that's suspended in the water that is susceptible to sunlight and temperature changes, things like that, it really only lasts maybe a week to three weeks. Um, but there's a lot of variables that can affect that, uh, you know, one big one being water quality. So if you have like a pretty acidic uh, peatland, for instance, that's going to degrade that material that much quicker. But there are people using DNA to look at historic records from like lake sediment cores, and they're actually using the DNA that's been preserved in those samples to look at historical records. So it's definitely possible. You just have to have a good idea of the conditions that the DNA has been uh, exposed to. Great, thanks, Jeanette. Mm -hmm. Emily, the next question is for you. So um, how different are wildlife mitigations in different places. So the examples used were in Banff, there's things like overpasses and there's underpasses in some locations. Um, and so I, so I think the questions are asking like, you know, why are different types of mitigations used in different areas? That's a very good question. And it's a, it's a complex one too. There are really, really a lot of different types of uh, wildlife crossings. Um, often it comes down to money. Um, so if you look at overpasses that you see in Banff, those are multi-million dollar projects. They're amazing. They work really good. They also need a very big investment. If you look at the ones on Highway 3 that I showed you on the map, um, on, the, on the BC side here of the highway, uh, those are underpasses, but they were actually existing bridges that were already there, and they just um, improved them to make them uh, easier for the animals to use. Uh, to cross under the highway. So you can see that it's going to be a lot cheaper. So both are good uh, and there are a lot of different ways you can have big culverts for animals. So I guess it depends on a few things. It depends of course on your budget. Like you said, there's a really wide range of price. Um, it depends on the animals that you're targeting. So you know if you're in the medicine nut area and you're targeting um, pronghorn, it's going to be very different than here if you're targeting um, elk, right? Um, yeah, so those are two, uh, two big ones. Also, what the land looks like, um, you know, if it's uh, in the mountains uh, versus in the plains, um, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a bit different the way you build it. You know, in the, in the mountain, if you have, let's say, a, a cut in the mountain to build a road, well, you can see how making an overpass might make sense at that point, right? So, yeah, it's very site-specific. Perfect. Thanks, Emily. Um, okay, well, I think we're, we're coming to the end. I've got one more question. I'm going to go back to Zach. Um, there was another question on the board for you. Um, and then we'll just to kind of quickly wrap up. But if you still have any other questions, please put them in the chat and we'll make sure those answers kind of come back to you. So uh, someone had asked about fire in the Waterton area. Obviously, they've been paying attention to the news and, and knows what, what happens on Waterton. So they were wondering sort of, are you incorporating fire in your study or how is that being sort of looked at as part of the assessment? Yeah, so not directly incorporating the fire. Um, the Kenai fire didn't hit a lot of the NCC properties that I'm going to be working on too hard. Um, it hit one of them pretty reasonably, and I imagine that uh, those types of differences would mostly be encompassed in the vegetation structure, which I will be looking closely at. So like the, the height of the plants and kind of how sparse or dense they are, um, as well as kind of which species are there. I expect that the fire would be present would be, you know, the effects of the fire would be visible in, in those assessments, but not directly attributing to the fire. Great, thanks, Zach. Um, okay, well, uh, we just want to thank everyone for, for joining us. At the uh, middle of the presentation, we had, I think, over 80 people tuning in today, so that's great. Um, thank you all for, for sort of joining us, and thanks to our our presenters, Zach, Sue, Jeanette, and Emily for sort of sharing your, your insights and your expertise. Um, we look forward to hearing how all these projects continue to move forward. Um, 
for anyone who's here as just a, a viewer, if you're interested in looking at when future webinars or events, check out our events page. So that's uh, on the screen. I won't read it out because no one wants to hear me read out a web page. Um, this will all be part of the package that gets mailed out to people who are signed up for the event uh, beforehand. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about sort of how to su support the Conservation Science Impact Fund or, or other projects in the Alberta region, please reach out to Kelty. So she's been the one who's been in touch with you uh, throughout sort of the, the process and, and registration. Um, to get you a little bit excited about for the next round of projects, you can come in tune to next year. Um, we've already lined up um, some projects. There's some really exciting work uh, on connectivity modeling in the crown of the continent. So that's southwestern Alberta and southeastern BC and through the United States sort of looking at pulling all sorts of, um, of, of radio caller data that's existed from, from past research uh, and how they can use that to sort of model current condition on the landscape. Um, Emily will be continuing her work in the Crow's Nest Pass and we're, we're looking forward to continuing to support sort of that work on both sides of the border. Uh, and finally, we've got a project looking at how to improve the efficiency of forest restoration with a focus on greenhouse technology. Um, so those are the projects that we're, we'll be highlighting in, in future years. Um, as I say, the web recording will follow in an email, um, and personally, I'd like to extend a really big thank you to uh, Kelty and Keisha. Kelty is making the slide presentation move as I just talked today, uh, and Keisha, you may not have heard from today, but most of you probably know her, and she's made sure all of our technology has functioned for us uh, this evening. So on behalf of everyone in the Alberta region uh, and the Nation Conservancy of Canada, we just want to thank you for joining us, and we hope you all have a wonderful evening.